Rachel Lim. Yeah. Yeah. She now runs more than 25 stores Damn. in six countries. Was there also a period where you you sat down and consider maybe you don't do this business anymore? You know, John, it was very hard. I did consider that, but I received an email from my husband and his title was A Cry For Help. Had you been a lesser person, that email might be the one that break it all, to be very honest. Yes, I think so. Do you also love medium-sized ray fin predatory fish specifically classified in the family scrum breeding? In that case, you love Bonito. <laughs> Your love is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I've never had any introduction like that. Oh but Bonito god, though. Really? I, uh, okay. I hope you have a question that asks me why and how the name came about. But yes. Purposely ignore, I'll delete it right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is your daily catch up. Okay, so here with us is one of Singapore's most successful entrepreneurs. She now runs more than 25 stores Damn. in six countries Ooh. with a fashion label that she started at 19. Man. So welcome, Rachel Lim! Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Very happy and very excited to be here. Ni hao, ni hao. I mean, so obviously based on my opening, you might have guessed that Rachel is the co-founder of Love Bonito. So why... Love Bonito. <laughs> yes, thank ah. you for the chance to explain. <laughs> so my co-founders and I started Love Bonito officially in, 20, in 2010, mm. which was 14 years ago. But unofficially, it was 18, 19 years ago. Back then, you know, we were known on Live Journal as Bonito Chico. That's right. Which is actually Spanish for pretty boy. Pretty boy. No yeah, way. so Bonito Chica is pretty girl <laughs> in Spanish, but we thought, okay, Bonito Chico rhymed better. So we ah. decided to go with Bonito Chico and we started by selling our pre love clothes online for extra pocket money. Mm. And eventually, uh, we ran out of pre love clothes to sell, but people kept coming back for more. I think it was the novelty of buying something online and mm. receiving it like three, four days later. Mm. Then we decided to use the money that we had saved to go overseas, like Bangkok, to import clothes to sell. So that was how it started, still under Love Bonito. Uh, still under Bonito. Bonito Chico, mm. but there was always something missing from the pieces that we brought in, that we imported, be it the quality, the fit, the design. So in my final year of university, with no fashion, no business, no design background, we decided to drop out of school to start the business proper, design, to start designing and manufacturing our own label. And that was how La Bonito started. How does one begin designing clothes? Like, Literally, yeah. you all draw on those, like, those triangles. I know, it was horrible. Though, and I can't draw <laughs> to save my life. Right? <laughs> and so, like, it was just really also using a lot of descript descriptive words, uh, cutting and pasting certain parts of a design that I like, that I see on a magazine, and then pasting it together to show, you know, the factory to be able to create a sample for us. Right. And then, you know, from there, you tweak along the way. So... In the beginning, especially, it was really fun in a sense, right? Because you get to see something come to life from literally scratch. Uh, so that was really the initial days of how, you know, we co-started Love Bonito. So, I mean, um, transiting from Bonito Chico to like having physical retail stores, right? It's obviously quite a big leap. How did that happen? I think along the way, we realised that, hey, it was taking traction. Women kept coming back for more. You know, women, would, uh, customers were telling us also that, thank you for being there for me when I need to go on my first date, first mm. interview, wow. first presentation, or, you know, be a bridesmaid to my best friend. So, you know that you're on to something. And ultimately, yeah. for me, I truly believe that fashion is just a vehicle for us to reach out to women, to be able to journey alongside her to be confident and to come into her own. Yeah, I, I remember there was a time where I think it was a huge marketing pivot for me from my point of view when y'all packaged bridesmaid dress. Yeah. yeah. And the bridesmaid dress are not identical. Yes, yeah, all just right. on the same theme. Mm -hmm. yeah, I also, my sister just probably bought all this. So I just, ah, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really smart. Y'all were one of the first few to do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think being the pioneer, especially in on the online shopping scene for women's fashion, I think we learn a lot along the way, right? And later, you know, I was talking to my friend about uh, the... The, the, the difficulties and challenges we were facing in the logistics world in Singapore. And then, you know, he hap he happens to be Chang Wen, who is the founder of Ninja Van. And that oh came along God. to support our growth <laughs> also uh, over the last decade. So, yeah, it's been a real interesting journey. So, when the opportunity to expand did present itself, right? Yeah. I mean, you did mention in quite a few interviews that what you saw was the need to strike while the iron's hot. Yeah. But there you were actually 
taking on a teaching degree at that point yeah. and bonded to the government. Can you walk us through a bit of like, what was actually going through your mind, right? Like the debate, what did yeah. that look like? Which is why a lot of the times, you know, when I give talks in universities and all that, people will always, they think that the, the the main point of my story is that we need to drop out of school and start a business, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is so far from people the People hear what they want to hear, man. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, when, when I finally decided to, you know, drop out of school to borrow money from my mom to pay off the bond to cold start the business proper, it, was, it wasn't out of like impulse, right? It also came from a time where we were already building the business on the side while mm. we were mm. schooling. I always believe this concept from Jim Collins where he says, before you fire the cannonball, fire bullets. Which means, you know, before the big investment into a risk, into yeah. uh, taking a big risk, you know, fire smaller risk projects first to test it out and try. So we have been testing out and trying on the side and realising mm. that, hey, if we were to focus more time, energy and attention on this so-called, you know, baby, mm. which is Bonito Chico and Lo Bonito, then, you know, there's a good chance that it would take off and do really well. And back then, I also realised that, hey, I wasn't excelling in school. Neither was I excelling at work because at work, I'll be so worried about my school assignments, my right. projects, my examinations. When I was in school, I was so worried about, you know, um, the orders of my customers, the emails that I have to attend to, the products to launch. So I decided that I just needed to focus and to just take a bet on one. Mm. So I was still, I felt then that, okay, you know, I was still young then. If this were to fail, if this venture were to fail, I can always go back to studying, work part-time to pay off my mom. But if I don't give this a proper shot, I feel like I will forever um, regret yeah. and wonder what if, if only I had, you know. And so um, that was extra tricky also because that was the year of a financial crisis and my mm. mom was going, my parents were going through bankruptcy. Um, Sorry. Oh, wow, terrible time to ask and for loan. My mom was already working two jobs to support the family. And I needed a five figure sum to borrow from her to pay off the government. And obviously, I didn't have that sum of money. And so I went to her and I was so afraid, right? And, you know, I, when I asked her for that sum of money, the first thing she said was, Actually, is what you're doing legal? Will the government come after you? Why mm. are people wiring you or transferring you money before they even see and touch their products. Mm. Oh. And back then, you must know that online shopping isn't like what it is today. Right. People were still wiring money over ATM transfers, scanning the receipts, emailing mm. it to Whoa. us, you know. So that was really the, the, the nascent stages. It really was a grey though, right? Whether or not it was legal. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm. You know, so that was also where she became very worried and was wondering, you know, if she should take this leap of faith and essentially invest her whole life savings into me. And I'm so glad she did. Sometimes I do wonder, and I ask her, actually, why did you take that leap of faith? And she said, mm. as a parent, you just also want to give your kid that opportunity, right? Yeah. Not blindly, but mm. also seeing how it has sort of taken off on its own. It's worth that that, that risk. Mm. So that was how I was able to come on board to co-start Love Bonito. So at no point was she like, why don't you finish your bond first? There were so many points oh. Uh, oh, okay. in, in the journey where even then, you know, she roped in my relatives to come and talk some sense oh. into me. Where it's like, oh, it's just 10 more months to go before you get a paper cell. Why don't you just, you know, finish it? So if anything, you can fall back on a, a degree or things like mm. that. And I'm sure, you know, it's that, that na the narrative that comes from concern, of course. But there was a naggy feeling in my heart that I knew that, okay, you know, I just needed to try and do this for myself. Mm. Yeah, and so I'm glad I managed to convince my mom to do that. Yeah. Mm. And so with that funding, you all became .com? Was that the that, period that That funding was just to pay off the government, yeah. Oh, and yeah, yeah, then right. after that, we just put together our own resources, you know, um, and then came to start lovebonito.com. Right. Mm. Yeah, because bonitochico.com was already cyber squatted by someone else <laughs> who demanded 20,000 US dollars from us. <gasps> so that's Sounds another like story. like something yeah. Dan would do. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Maybe it's Dan. <laughs> So that was the reason why we rebranded from Bonito Chico to Love oh. Bonito. Because we actually ah. wanted bonitochico.livejournal.com to then just move transition yeah. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, bonitochico.com. Yeah, yeah. But someone had already had... But that person uh, saved you all, right? Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. Because when we rebranded to Love Bonito, it had so much more meaning we felt behind it. Yeah. It's like with love, comma, bonito. Mm. So it's just like a sign off. Like mm. love, comma, beautiful. 
Yeah. Oh, that explains the comma. Yes. Yeah. yes. And so, like made you take out a chico, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny at first, you know, because it was catchy, but why you go internationalize with this very yeah. chico pay Already name. Bonito, there's so many different interpretations. Like people will come up to me in business conferences. They're like, oh, yeah. so you're in the fish business. That must yeah. be very interesting. <laughs> so, but anyways, yes. Well, the convention you go to is very <laughs> <much>. <laughs> In an alternate universe, all the men in Spain are wearing love Bonito. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, right? I do have no bonito clothes. Oh. Yeah, y'all have a very limited men yes, collection. Chinese, yeah, I yes. do have a t-shirt. That is expanding. You're yeah. surrounded by yeah. true fans. I'm yes, so yes, grateful. Yes. <laughs> Thank so you. So this Chinese New Year got Yes, 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 have. Say how to buy one and you think what you oh, want. Is it, is it? <laughs> <laughs> one, eh. I don't know. I do business do until like that. Oh, very impressive. Eh. We may or may not have a promo code to share. Uh, they just wait, wait, wait. Yes, we may or may not have a promo code to share. At, at some point, I don't know. I mean, right now, I'm, I'm sure you will have increased the supply to meet yeah. this demand. But yeah. last time it was my, my sister and my wife bonded over wow, a certain time of the day. The same, yeah. They need to camp and then they just check out. They don't give a f about yeah, the yeah. sizes. <laughs> we just check out after that the secondary market we can swap well, sizes. I know, we'll <laughs> yeah, let's all just get a f***ing bonito dress first. Like, oh. They're like, guys, it's from Bangkok. Y'all know it's from Bangkok or not? Wait, like, at that point time, they already ago. crazy yeah, already. Yeah, yeah. That, was yeah. the, that means we go way back to wow. way, way, way. 15, 18 years ago. Wow. Yeah. It was so crazy. It's like you wait, then like one you change your size from M to S gone really, no oh more you're dear. done. Yeah. Yeah. The trick is to check out first, then you back somebody's swap with you later. <laughs> really? Yeah. This it was is very online insane. shopping is only on Facebook. No, it and, was. And there like was a, wasn't, even, it wasn't even Facebook then. Huh. It was Friendster. Do you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes, no, it was on a live journal platform, which was kind of like the eBay for Singapore. Who was your competition then? Nobody. Also or the people. other shop in like Far East Mall, that kind of. No, and also there were, after that, there were a lot of different, you know, um, blog shops that came out. Um, yeah, during oh, that time also. Yeah. First, they were we one were one of the, of the first few, one yeah, for sure. No, was there like a moment mm. where where you realized that it was more than just fashion? Like wh what What was the sign? You know, actually in 2013, so that's after a few years after, you know, starting and running the business and you realize that, wow, it's actually very tough uh, and it's very hard. And as an entrepreneur, sometimes your work consumes you, right? Because it's not just Monday to Friday, nine to five. It's literally seven days a week, 24 seven. And so also after going through some really difficult moments in the business, I was feeling in 2013, 2014, really tired and really jaded. And to a mm. point where I almost questioned myself like, okay, honestly, if we were to close Love Bonito, how will it impact people? People will just move on at the end of the day, right? So I needed to dig deep and to ask myself like, what is my purpose in Love Bonito and what is Love Bonito's purpose in the world? And almost divinely, or as you know, as some of us might believe, you know, the universe conspires to work for us for something. So uh, I received an email uh, from a customer and she said, you know, hey Rich, can I come down to share with you a little bit about how Love Bonito has made a difference in my life? And so ah, at that point, I remember oh, I was letter. feeling very jaded, <laughs> tired, but I was just like, oh, sure, I would love to hear from you. Just come down and, you know, we can chat. I remember 30th August, you know, that year. And Whoa. I remember when she came down to office, she was this girl in her mid-20s and she was walking and talking very slowly and uh, really only moving from her right side of her body. The entire left side uh, was immobile. Oh, no. And as I sat her down, she said, you know, Rach, over the last six months, I've been in and out of major brain surgery because Ooh. she needed a skull reconstruction. There was something Ooh. sitting on the left nerve of her brain. And she said, um, I lost everything, my crown of glory, my confidence, my weight, everything, you know. And she said, but every day during my recovery period where I needed to go out to... Uh, for my medical checkup when I needed to go out for job interviews again. She said, every day I choose to put on a piece of Love Bonito clothing because it gives me the courage and the confidence to look at myself in the mirror. Wow. And when she said that, I was really in tears because it was almost like God telling me, this is why Love Bonito exists and it's really more than just fashion. It's like seven weeks so after choose. that incident, it really resonated with me that this is why we exist. We are here to empower women's confidence and mm. fashion is just a vehicle. So mm. yeah, I think that was the opening of so much more uh, for me and the team to then also really listen to the customers and the stories and to hear how we have come alongside them in this journey yeah. of life. I would like to jump back to how I met Rachel. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so right, growing up, uh, I have sisters, big fan. My wife was a big fan. Mm. Uh, I think y'all had y'all had uh, something called LB girl for a moment. 
Yes, so yes, yes. you're like send them vouchers and stuff yes. like that. And Pat was one and she was so happy. Like Aww. that made her year, you know. Wow. But in the end, she net spent a lot more money. Yeah. So I, I believe she's putting one or two people on payroll in LBE today. <laughs> I've always looked up to you as an entrepreneur because I think you were one of the first few vocal entrepreneurs in Singapore mm. that really just not talk about business, but really talk about relationships and, and mm, mental journey. health and stuff like that, right? Yeah, and the journey or the hardships of entrepreneurship. And also you were a Singapore darling. And so- What do you mean by were? I mean, you are. No, <laughs> no, in, no, I'm joking. I'm joking, I'm joking. How dare you? Okay, no. anyway. And then, right, I was having dinner with um, with Sham um, and, and Sherry and with my wife, owners of B Salon, shout out. Um, oh. then, we, then we saw her walk in together with Leo and I didn't see lights at the back. Then Pat immediately lost her shit already, right? <laughs> Pat's like, Rachel, Rachel is behind you. Then, then I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, they're totally yeah. like not. <laughs> How? No, because it was too U shape, you know. Then I was still like, you know? in my head, right? I keep thinking, okay, I I do want to say hi to her and let her know that I respect her very much and perhaps perhaps invite her to the show. Uh. But I was working out all through dinner. It's a very long multi course dinner. <laughs> and then when we say hi. She was like, I was trying to look for your eyeline so that I could say hi. Yeah. Now I'm like, what? So my side of the story, I was uh, running a little bit late for my husband's birthday dinner. Oh. So anyways, oh, I, I went like in. I said that then. <laughs> I just like went hi hi and then. No, okay. it's okay. Because we, we, I seldom get to see, meet people like that, right? right? So anyways, uh, so when I sat down also, I told my husband, I said, oh, that's the daily catch up guy. And he was like, oh, who, where? But I said, okay, don't turn, don't turn. Don't make, <laughs> don't make it yeah, so obvious. But then he also, <laughs> yeah, so he couldn't uh, pretend pretend to just turn around but yeah yeah so I, I knew John was there and I was hoping that when he would if he were to leave us then you know get to say hi or so and how much I really enjoy the podcast and the work that you guys are doing wow well, thank I'm you I'm done it. we're done <laughs> we have all we need <laughs> so Love Bonito was actually one of I mean if not the first to create like an area for boyfriends to sit during their shopping <laughs> time right <laughs> how did the idea so come powerful, about right yeah yeah John have is you been? <laughs> I, I went there to sit down, but without a <laughs> girlfriend. I fired her. No seat. Then I already buy drink already. So I don't chase you. so kind. No, then after they put it at the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I went to the side. Like yeah. uh. No, the you idea came what? about because we realised that, you know, when we when we started opening physical retail stores, whether it's pop-up or longer-term stores, there were a lot of partners that were crowding around the stores and just like standing there. Yeah, some of them grouchy. Yeah. Some of them just, okay, you know, but they were just literally like that yeah, with the outside hands the dress, folded. the changing yeah. room, right? Yeah. yeah. And so we're thinking, okay, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, we need to find a place where, you know, we consolidate we'll that and like, make <laughs> sure that, yeah. <laughs> and also hopefully they don't disrupt other customers' yeah. shopping experience, yeah. you know. Also, I think you get more retention per customer. Yes. Yeah. And so we, oh. we realised that if we were to take care of the partners, naturally, the yeah. women will feel more at ease, you know, shopping, yeah. taking their time because sometimes it's very stressful for the customers. From the customer's point of view, they share that okay my boyfriend is waiting there already yeah, I, yeah, I need yeah, to pass yeah. around if not he'll become very grumpy mm. so we realised okay at least if we try to cordon off some space for them to rest mm. they wouldn't be as yeah. grumpy maybe yeah, <laughs> so when it I first know. came out I was like you'll never get me <laughs> oh. I don't mind. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy. I will shop with my. I will shop with my girlfriend slash wife. I'll help her pick the nice pieces. Oh. Correct. I will be the one recommending. Oh, no. And then I go out. I never said I go sit down. <laughs> one day later, I went to sit down. Cause Pat keep rejecting your suggestion. <laughs> no, no, she, she said he wants. She will buy one. So cute. I feel like I was encouraging her to go there every chance we get. Oh, oh. I see. Then I'm like, oh, I'm sending the wrong signal. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It's about budgeting now. <laughs> but she still it's cannot resist. Value yeah. for money. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. Um, the the co-founders of. Back then, probably Bonito Chico has yeah. had a split of sorts, right? Yeah. How did that happen? What was the reason? Yeah. Can we share? So Love Bonito started out with you know um, three of us, you know three mm. of us co-founders, and in 2013, one of my co-founders decided to um, leave to pursue something else, mm. and I think I took it very hard because also you know we were close friends, and when we started, we really fell into it. When we started, it was just something fun, right? Mm. Um, that we decided to do together and it evolved into something more and we just decided to go along for the ride. But of course, you know, along the way, um, you know, there were no boundaries of certain things or there was no rules or expectations set in place. Yeah. Uh, things got murky as well. So I think, you know, it became hard for everyone as well. Uh, and that was when my co-founder decided to 
just also take a break and pursue something else. Mm. I mm. think, you know, that in itself is also a lesson, right? For us, back then we were all young, not just in age, but in experience as well. Mm. What do you think is maybe like the biggest thing you've learned about yourself as a friend having gone through this? Because a lot of people also say don't start a business with friends, yeah. right? Because you either lose your business or you lose both. Yeah. And I think, not specific to your case, right? Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of things that like, when it comes to money, is very sensitive. And then like you mentioned, perhaps like boundaries that are, or what are not drawn and all that. And then how then do you react as a friend in this scenario? What do you think you've learned from your personal experience? I think, you know, like maturity is something that I have grown you know, especially looking back on the experiences in the past. Mm. Um, Today, if you ask me, will I start business with friends? My answer is actually I might, you know, because Mm. I'm a lot... I I know what what to look out for, what to set in place and what to be mindful of and to address from the get-go before we even go into business partnership together. I think there's always pros and cons to starting Mm. business with friends or non-friends and I think it's not so straightforward or a one-size-fits-all answer. So I think it really boils down also a lot to like, you know, how aligned are you in the vision, uh, working through communication style, how do you resolve conflicts, you know, uh, your commitment to open, honest, conversations especially when the going gets tough when things are easy it's fine nobody thinks about um, bringing up uh, tough and rough conversations so I think it's things like that that I have learned uh, also through the past experiences and I think yeah it's something I'll look out for and definitely I wouldn't say no to um, working with friends I think it's just finding the right fit was there also a period where you you sat down and consider maybe we don't do this business anymore and if it's not at that You know, period, John, it was very when? hard. I did consider mm. that. But also, you look at your team members and the mm. team that you're built and you also realise that, oh, you're responsible for them and them taking care of their families, for better or for worse, right? Mm. Mm. And it has come to a point where it's not just about you. That gives me a little bit more strength to be able to go through the difficult period. Yeah. Mm. I realize in many of the with many of the entrepreneur friends that I do speak to, we all mm. go through these little milestones as mm. well. Um, of these realizations and all in our v- different way. Yeah. The conclusion and the lesson is very much similar. And I think I've spoken about this multiple times on the mm. show as well. That that this is one of those lessons that every entrepreneur learned on that journey. Mm. That should I give up? Why don't I just take a break? And then yeah. you, you think about your friends that's getting poached on LinkedIn for a higher offer than what you pay yourself. Yeah. They're like, mm. <laughs> you know, I should go and get a higher pay, mm. you know. Um, and that stuff that you learn along the way and then you take a step back and then you realise, no, this was never about you to begin yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I'm kind of wondering also, right, like what do you think is perhaps a common blind spot that entrepreneurs tend to have? Because mm. I mean, you've talked about imposter syndrome as well in uh, another AMA that you've done yeah. and all that. And Well, you did your homework. Thank you. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and I would imagine that there's something a lot of founders struggle with because yeah. this is they're starting something that yeah. is, perhaps is no roadmap there yeah. so do you have advice for people who are struggling with a that? lot of the times imposter syndrome comes in, a, in, in waves like self-doubt right like you know negative self-talk or like doubts planted in your head and still today I get it I, I get it as well and I think it's not so much about wanting to kill that monster but how can we quieten that voice in our heads and you know for me I also do an exercise called fear setting so we all know about goal setting you sit down you write down your goals you make plans but there is also an exercise that I learned from Tim Ferry it's called fear setting where you know you really dissect that fear monster in your head and write down what exactly are you afraid of and how can you conquer what you're afraid of so for example if what I'm afraid of is podcast in this world is a completely new industry it's a media industry that I might not be familiar with you know so okay if that's the fear that's hold, one of the fears that's holding me that me back how can I overcome it you know and what's the worst that can happen so how I can overcome it is I can talk to people like you learn from your read up mm. uh, and then really reminding myself that you know it's okay if I don't know now but I believe in my ability to learn it's insane your journey and, and I feel like there's one gap that's, that I would love to know how you climb that gap, right? That, you know, you went from blog shop, then after that you went to a dot com and yeah. then you have your own checkout domain, perhaps your own delivery service, you went to your yeah. own designs. Yeah. Then, yeah, of course, um, it feels like a very simple logical step to be mm. like, if we can, perhaps let's go retail, let people touch before yeah. they buy, correct? Yeah. And then from there, if you have one good retail store, let's have two. Mm. But between there and... <laughs> 
25 stores. 25 stores in six countries. I feel like there was a there was a giant leap of yeah. which I'm guessing that there was a figure that came into your life to help you jack up to that level. Yeah. Was there? I think it's hard to pinpoint to one person. It's mm. definitely a lot of like, it's definitely collective effort. And along the way, hashing out, weighing out all the pros and cons, if we should mm. do this, if we should not. Uh, definitely learning from mistakes as well. So yeah, I mean, if the question is like, was one person responsible in that sense for bringing us uh, from one store to 20 over stores, then... No, I would Don't say it's really... Yeah. One step at a time. Yeah, one I step see. at a time. So in the recent years, you've also become a lot more outspoken about self-care and say mental wellness and mm. all of this, right? Was there a moment in your life or perhaps in your business that caused this perhaps pivot or sobering? Of <laughs> yeah, I, along the way, you know, I have learned in my through my journey that we can only pour from a full cup. I can't pour from an empty cup. I can't take care of my team. I can't take care of my family or I can't take care of my kids if I myself don't take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in my journey of doing the inner work, um, you know, working on myself, being more self-aware, I think it has also brought a lot of realizations of, you know, my past patterns and habits that may not be healthy. For example, I learned that I am a people pleaser. I'm a recovering people pleaser now. So what that means is that... <laughs> type I two, type two. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to say yes to everyone. I tend to... I'm not able to draw boundaries properly. And even though I am so tired and exhausted, I will say yes to an event, uh, even though I actually don't feel up for it. Mm. And so I think it's things like that that also made me realize that hey, in the end of the, at the end of the day, I suffer because I'm really burning out and it's zapping out a lot of my mental capacity and attention from doing things that are truly important in my life. So I think it became very vocal also about then, you know, working on ourselves, investing in ourselves and growing. You know, there was this um, book that I read last year. It's called The Five Regrets of the Dying. And mm. it's written by this palliative nurse oh, in God, I read about <gasps> Australia. <gasps> Sounds interesting. Bronnie Ware. And she's spent 30 years, 30 plus years taking care of people in their dying days. And, you know, she was chatting with them, talking to them. And she said, there are five key regrets that, you know, people have on their dying bed. The top regret people say that they wish is that, I wish I had lived a life true to myself, not a life someone expected of me to live. Wow. And I think that for me is sobering because I think so many times we take on society's expectations, our parents' expectations, peer pressure to do things or to mm. become something. But at the end of the day, do we really uncover deep down our desires, our passions, our inclinations, you know, things like that. So that's what I'm really passionate also about in helping. Yeah. yeah people I read that book though. I feel like there's a huge bias to it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing the ways I made, though, book review yeah. the whole self-help phase I, I read a bunch of books right and then I realised god they're all saying the same thing which is <laughs> like similar to this law in yeah. this like uh, you know you live your life that kind of vibe of which I feel the bias of this one is mm. the fact that it's a bunch of people that were that eventually were in a palliative care of a home right and they were, they were people that have already lived most of their life Mm -hmm. they have made the mistakes that they have made that let them there already mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if this is applicable to people in their early 20s right. trying to hustle because I mean hustle is not a negative word I think he has been demonized right yeah. but in, in our early days of hustle the, the experiences that we got and the learning that the leveling up that we had was, was because of those hustle the, because of the event you went when you were burnt out you know, whether or not you got nothing from the event, going to the event while you were burnt out shows yourself that you can never die as long as you choose to live. And then I realized mm -hmm. that I, as I read that book, and I read that book, I think just two years ago, that, and, and two years ago, the, the business has grown to a certain yeah. extent, right? We don't feel like such a startup anymore. Mm. And I really am like, yeah, 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 I agree. You know, I agree. They, they also say like work less. I think one of the points- I wish I didn't spend so much time working. Correct. Mm. Yeah, but then you also see that those are people that have already paid their dues to their family and their mm -hmm. whatnot already. And if in your 20s, I don't know whether I'll take that advice. I think mm. I read that book and my conclusion was it's terrible advice if I'm 20. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. But so much of this, right? And why like self-help books are like, like the same messages, but all of them are communicated differently and packaged differently, right? It's mm. because I feel like at the end of the day, everybody will need to learn these few lessons. Mm. But when the stories uh, yeah. reach you yeah. and how they reach you and yeah. how you can receive yeah. them is, is so important. 
Yeah, like but I agree. It's just I think there are many it. authors that's cashing out on that. Yeah, to the point where the main agenda of many of the self help books, or maybe I just very lucky enough to pick out the bad mm. ones, right? <laughs> was it's about be yourself, go at your own pace, chill. Mm. This is your life. Mm. Don't have to compare yourself to other people. Yeah, which I I think are all good advice in yeah. small doses when mm-hmm. you reach certain stage in life. Mm. But what we also have is entire generation that reinforces laziness and self-expression over mm-hmm. many other things in life that benefit society. And I feel like you come a full circle when you realize mm. that you bring nothing to the world. No, but I think it's that's why like self-awareness is so important because like what John Paul said, right? Like it depends on when or how this message comes to you. And like yeah. I can read the same thing now and I read the same thing 10 years later. It's going to yeah. mean something true. totally different. So then yeah. to you, what does it then look like in your 20s mm. to live your life that's true to you? It doesn't mm. mean that you don't hustle. And then in your 30s, then recalibrate and then what does that look like? So I think it's right. so interesting. Like, it's, 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 but that's what I saw. You mm. know? That's what I saw in, yeah. in my friends that, for example, start in corporate loops mm. of which, I mean, corporate loops is not wrong. It's not a mm, bad thing. It's, mm, it's a great thing, right? Yeah. Um, but some of them, they don't see that progression anymore. And then you look at their lifestyle, you also see like, you kind of get why they're not seeing that progression also. And and the book that they are carrying in their hand is just telling them, hey, it's okay. Chill. Yeah, and that's why I feel like, mm. Which book is that? Later. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but it's very interesting. <laughs> it's very, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm very curious. No, because it's yeah. very interesting. We all, yeah. you know, extract different meanings mm. out of the same books that we read. And like you mm. said, I think it's also like depending on the seasons of life that we're in. Um, I think for me, that book is really more very personal to me in terms of like really don't live a life that society expects you to be. And I'll share a little bit more because, mm. you know, when I first started as a founder, as a co-founder and as a leader, back then, the only types of founders and leaders that I could I could look up to were the media, glamor- gl- were the media glamorized Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. And I mm. thought that, you know, um, in order to succeed, I needed to be like them. Mm. Whatever that the world deems success- as success or successful, I would immediately try and emulate, you yeah. know, disregarding actually, deep down, am I really like that? Or, Right. Am I meant to lead differently? And so I went on that journey of like trying too hard to be like someone else. It obviously didn't work. I went home and I hated myself because it's so unlike me. And it wasn't until being on that very intentional journey of really discovering myself, who I am, whether is it through different uh, strengths finders tests or going to coaches or therapy and finding out, okay, actually this is your, your natural inclination, you know, uh, and then working on myself, that really helps me. And I think one of the major things is because I think so many times as founders, you're expected to be the CEO or one of the founders is expected to be the CEO. And I would say to your question earlier, so one of the other things that I'm most proud of in my journey is to recognize and embrace that I'm not the CEO of Love Bonito and be completely okay with that. And that came with so much questioning from society and the world. Like, oh, what do you mean you're not a CEO? You have to hire someone in to be the CEO? Is it because you're not good enough? Is there something that you've done that the board doesn't think you're worthy to be a CEO? Mm. And to go through that whole journey and again, hold hold true to the fact that I'm not going to be what society wants me to be just because, but I really am going to dig deep and ask myself, do I have the abilities or the appetite also to become the CEO of Love Bonito at this stage and Mm. things like that? Came with so much freedom in that sense, you Mm. know, recognizing that while I have value to bring to Love Bonito, it is not in the capacity of the CEO, which is known as the most prestigious title mm-hmm. in a company. So, so so when you were talking about like the various methods, right? Was there a particular one that was ex- especially effective? Like when you talk about coaching or therapy and whatnot? Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of people ask, oh, if I can only choose one, which would you, you know, recommend? But I think it, it <laughs> all culminates. I got right? budget, I got budget. <laughs> <laughs> I got budget, I want A lot of people are talking about you, though. Yeah. <laughs> they call it the microwave mentality where you just want a quick fix, right? But, yeah. you know, unfortunately, it really takes years of digging deep and it's so many forms, right? Whether is it the different strengths fighters tests or coaches, therapies, mm-hmm. really being so thick-skinned to ask for hard feedback from my team members and being okay with it when they give me that hard feedback, even though I feel like I just want to bury myself in the ground because I feel so uncomfortable what or is embarrassed. It? What is it? It's just like, for example, that, you know, um, 
I'm all over the place. I'm messy when I bring ideas to the table. That it, it they confuses say that to you. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think the when fuck, you're giving me feedback all the time. Right? No, yeah, yeah. no you're, when you're, you say, your feedback very kind, man. Hey, John, you're all over the place. Eh. <laughs> but I'm not over the place, man. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, that's why. Exact words like uh. that, but in that same message that you take, in that same message that you take away. Yeah. yeah. Girl, so yes, listen, listen. Like, <laughs> giving people that safe space to give you feedback, I think, mm. is key also. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I think mean, that has helped me grow as a person, as a leader. Mm. I, I feel like an on for a founder to pick a CEO is one of the big milestone decisions mm. that, that you have to make. How did you find Dion? What yeah. was it about Dion? I remember in 2015, I went to my invest one of my investors, Hien, from Open Space, and I told him, you know, this is um, where Love Bonito is at, and this is the potential of Love Bonito. And in order for us to get from here to there, we really need to bring a CEO on board. Mm. You know, and that was when we began this journey of searching for potential CEOs. So there were many different candidates that we spoke to, interviewed along the way, and you realize that uh, even though you have years of experience building like a retail business or things mm. like that, similar businesses, um, I really feel like there's something missing. Whether is it that spark, the ability and intuition to understand the business, the customers. Mm. Um, and I think that was something I was also looking out for, right? Someone who ultimately is also, um, we have the same values and principles. We don't need to agree on everything. In mm. fact, Dion and I are so different, right? We are not like-minded but we are light-hearted. We care about the mission of um, the business and we care about the people. Um, and so that was when I started to look for potential candidates. Mm. And I think like eight months on, I couldn't find anyone. So I almost gave up. I just think it's okay, it's fine. Um, you know, when it comes, it comes. Mm. So one day I was at um, a women's networking dinner that I wanted to go for, not that I couldn't say no <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah. But <laughs> But yes, uh, so I went to the networking dinner and that was when I met Dion for the first time. Right. And what was she doing then? No, she was back then the managing director of Zalora. Ah, oh, yes. I so that was all oh, interesting because Zalora is also, you know, in fashion yeah. and things yeah. like that. So mm. that was when I started talking to her a bit and realized that, wow, okay, we hit it off. And I decided to then ask her out for drinks after a mm. few weeks later, Smooth. you know. <laughs> <laughs> to tap on her brains on certain things. Honestly, I didn't think at all that, oh, she's the right person back then. Yeah. At, in, at also the meeting. audacity to try and poach the CEO. <laughs> of Zalora, right? MD, uh, but, MD, still, yeah. but still, but yeah. still, yeah. So that was when we started and then, you know, we realized that we could really get along and I really find that we're very complimentary. She has such mm. great ideas, fresh perspective and things like that. And so, uh, and it wasn't until six months later that I decided to ask her, pop the question to her. <laughs> like Dion will you you know come on board to build Love Bonito together with us and be the CEO so her oh, side back telling. then she was MD of Zalora and then sorry she just moved to Sephora back then oh. yeah. Right. yeah to lead yeah one wow. of the arms yeah. she's really young isn't it she's young she's one year younger than me so that's very young. No, I'm joking. No, she, but she's very young. She's you, 19. You are very young. Yeah. And 19. From her POV telling these stories that she had to go through 50 rounds of interview <laughs> with her. No, because it was, also, it was also her interviewing me, right? I mean, yeah. it was, she was in she was in a large a organization. Job, yes. Yes. Yeah, she was in a large organization coming to a startup. It's very different, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, You're yeah, yeah. over gin and tonic even yeah. though I don't drink, but I, I just like, you know. Exactly. She also don't drink the whole time. She was pretending for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So speaking about the period of time where you in a sense ran yourself a bit ragged like saying yes to events and then expanding Love Bonito and spending all this time there and from your podcast I've actually heard directly from your husband <laughs> that, <laughs> that it did affect your relationship mm. for a period of time could you mm. maybe walk us through how he raised that to you mm. and then mm. how you guys proceeded to start to work things out well where do I start you know after I had my first son Oliver Congrats. Thank you. Yeah, it's almost like your whole world turned upside down because suddenly, for for me, I realized that there is something more important than work. Mm. Mm. For the longest time, you know, I to me, work has always been the most important. So, for example, even at dinner dates with my husband, if someone were to just message me or Slack me, you know, or email me, I would immediately respond, and he 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 would just be like, "What's what's so." what's so urgent that you can't even wait half an hour? Like, is your office burning down? Is the store mm. burning down? What is it? And so, you know, I've always struggled in that sense to be able to balance. Mm. Yeah. Or, or does balance even exist? But yes, you mm. know, and so when my first child came along, it was a lot tougher because I realised that, A, I was giving every ounce of my energy to work and every ounce of my energy to my son when I came home. 
Um, and then by the time when everyone is gone to sleep, you know, my husband was like, oh, how's your day? What's going on? I didn't have any energy left at all to talk mm. or to respond. I'll just be like, oh, it's fine. It's good, you know? Even though I might be going through a tough time at work. Mm. And I didn't really share as much as I used to. And then one day he came to me. He said, you know, I only find out about your store openings on your company's LinkedIn page now. And mm. that really broke my heart because that's not what I want in a marriage or in a relationship. And after that, you know, um, I, I, I still take it for granted. I didn't really, you know, do much about, you know, reconnecting or repairing um, the disconnection in our marriage. So uh, a few weeks later, I went to Philippines for a work trip. And when I landed in Philippines, um, I received an email from my husband and his title was A Cry for Help. And he wrote this whole long email about how I have neglected my marriage with him for everything else, you know. And he was almost like pleading with me to come back again to the marriage. And I was really, I remember, I was at the immigration reading it, immig queuing, immigration queue mm. reading it, and I was really in tears because I just felt like, is this really what I want in life? At the end of the day, you know, so what if I have built a great company, you know, or so what if um, the kids are happy but my marriage is suffering? Is this really what I want? And then I remember what one of my mentors told me. She said, in life, we all juggle different responsibilities, right? You just need to know at each point when you juggle, which balls are made of rubber and which balls are made of glass. Where if you need to drop a ball, make sure that it's not one that is made of glass because it would shatter mm. and it would never be the same. Make sure it's the one made of rubber because it would bounce, bounce, bounce and it would still be okay. It would bounce back up. So that was when I also realized and reminded myself that, hey, marriage is a glass ball to me. I don't ever want to neglect or drop it. So it was a really hard time I faced and it was almost like sobering. Um, and I, I decided to take active steps to um, rebuild the relationship, rebuild the marriage and invest time into him and the marriage again. So I remember this quote that says, you know, don't tell me your priorities, show me your calendar. So don't mm. just tell me what's important in your mm. life. Show me how you're spending your time. Mm. And I realized that so many times I have so many different slots carved out for seemingly important things like one-on-one -on -one with your team leads, one-on-one -on -one mm. with your team members, but I never had time carved out for my husband, which is bad. That means, you know, it would... It seldom happens because it wasn't planned for yeah. and it was, no time was actually set aside for intentional connection. Mm. So besides date nights, which is a bit more casual, we also now have like weekly meetings in our calendars where we really just spend a solid <laughs> 45 minutes with each other talking like, how's your week been? Is there something that I can support you through? What are you wow. going through? Oh. That's and like a checklist. Eh? You are so yeah, wholesome. Yeah. Eh? No, Weekly also because appraiser. it's very intentional. <laughs> You're such fantastic people. <laughs> if, not, I mean, if, if not, I think it will really cause yeah. a, a Structure lah. Structure, Structure is very important. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Right, right. How do you, like in that moment, right? How do you respond to an email like that? My first reaction, sorry, besides sadness is that, oh, I'm working so hard, you know, why can't you understand, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But then after that, of course, as my emotions subsided and, you know, um, I really thought through and I felt so bad that he, that he would feel this way. So it took me a while to respond, of course, because I wanted to be more thoughtful in my response. Yeah, so I, yeah, I apologize. I acknowledge and I really yeah, acknowledge how he was feeling and I apologize for it. And I said, when we're back, let's talk and let's set like intentional steps to working this out. I think more importantly is also him hearing from me that I'm sorry and that I am willing to work it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because mm. I think in, in many marriages or mm. whatnot, this can very be easily be perceived as she he simply doesn't understand what I'm going through. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. why you choose to be needy at this time when I have a meeting in the Philippines with probably some important person in the Philippines. Then the immigration officer asks, what's the purpose of your visit? <laughs> <laughs> she showed her email. She the email. <laughs> <laughs> Running away. Oh, oh no. No, 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 no. I mean, had you been a lesser person, that email might be the one that break it all, to be very honest. Mm -hmm. Oh, if I had I been a less mature person, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think so. I'm also a bit curious because, uh, I mean, for people who also don't know you and Leo do have quite a big age gap, right? 14 years, yes. Yes. Oh, really? mm -hmm. So he, he's 50. When when I saw John last year, oh. yeah, he was celebrating She's his 50th birthday. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. How did y'all meet? Uh? 
in church. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's yeah. So he was your cell leader. That's where you find the no, good ones, yeah. guys. <laughs> so biased. How, how come Wait. I can't be his cell leader? Yeah, no, you're not sexy, really. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. None of, <laughs> none of it is true. He's not my cell leader. I'm not his cell leader. It's so very creepy that. if he's the cell leader. If you're the cell leader. No, <laughs> nah. no, 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 of course, of course, since I'm the one here telling with the mic, he likes me, he liked me first, so yeah. <laughs> no, I, will, I will assume that that is true as well. <laughs> <laughs> but so y'all but but were just in the same church, but y'all don't know each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then it was like a... Then it was like, can oh, I pray friends for you? recommend... <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's such a sick move. Oh, what? Pick up lines. No, no, no. no. I hope you find a no, good man. John, Someone who is nice. Nice, nice, nice. No, no, no. Someone it was near just like you. Right? <laughs> 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 then, okay. Then what happened? Then what? How? Wait, how come oh, you're what? so interested? Okay, okay, okay. Let's yeah, go. Let's say. I don't know how you all met. Yeah. How does one know that this is the founder of Love Bonito and like? Yeah, I'm I want to marry try. her. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> so the first. one thing that I love is that he actually didn't know who I was. And this was like maybe like, 10 years or however many years ago. So which is great, right? right. Um, yeah, so that was when you also slowly start to be, oh, I'm just doing something on my own. Or when we, when the question comes, oh, what are you doing? You know, things like that. So then slowly you became friends uh, who get along and that's how it evolves. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing so You're juicy. You're holding back some yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. She's cutting it. She's cutting it. Yeah, come here, hold back. It's the wrong show to hold back. <laughs> but do you think that like, because you did mention in another interview as well that you felt that you were kind of putting off the idea of having kids, even though you did want a family, yeah. but because you were building Love Bonito mm, and mm. it was difficult to divide the energy, you wanted to put that off, but yeah. did, your, did Leo's age put a different pressure mm. that you needed to have a child earlier because if not like now he have to run after a child then after <laughs> it's later true. on it's mm. like 20 years later he's 70 plus really. growing up I've always known that uh, I want to have kids and I think I'm a nurturing person so I, I love to be a mom. so I think I withheld back you know um, the plan to have a kid was also because it was also because I was afraid that it might take up time mm -hmm. from me building the business, investing and giving myself into the business. So that was what it was for a few, a couple of years after we got married. And then when we finally felt ready to try, you know, then it wasn't as easy that I, it wasn't as easy as I assumed. To you conceive. Know, to conceive, right. yeah. Uh, it took a while. Uh, we had to go for, you know, Checkups also to ensure that everything is okay. So yeah, I think one of the reasons why we decided to also start back then when we started maybe three, four years ago was also because it's true, right? Leo keeps telling me that he's not getting any younger and he's calculating, right? By the time I'm 70, our child is only, you know, 18 or something. I can't remember the exact mm. um, age it, now. It can't be, but, uh. <laughs> Actually, if you think about it, wait, um, if he's 50, we just had a newborn. Oh, so, the latest one. Uh. No, yeah. la, you come from the first one. Because okay, the first so one will juggle the, the rest. First one. Okay, <laughs> so four years old this year. Okay, but anyways, yeah. By yeah, that time, yeah. he's yeah, almost 68. He's 18, you know? Right. So like for him, he also feels like you need a lot of energy to bring mm. a kid up and you will want to see your kid live as long yeah. as you can, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah, these were serious considerations that made us decide to, yeah. Just now you're talking about how, you know, the business was always the most important yeah. part mm. of your life until you have this child and then the child now becomes the most important part of your life. Did that come naturally and immediately? Or you had to mm. sort of mind f yourself? Mm. <laughs> I've yeah. always been curious about that. Especially uh. as a guy where I don't carry the child. Mm. Now you, we introduce a new helpless being into our life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Are you really the most important mm. being to me, you know? And yeah. I would like to know from you. Yeah, I guess it's a very personal revelation. Um, actually, for me, I was surprised I even had that revelation. Mm. And oh. it came about not when I was pregnant, but really more when uh, after I gave birth, you know, then I realized that, wow, actually there's something that takes up so much more of my heart than, you know, my business wow. and my time. And I guess, yeah, that, that was when I also realized that, okay, you know, I need to also prioritize properly and sure that I'm fully present when I'm at work. I want to make sure that I'm fully at work and not worrying about my mm. child. And when I'm with my child, I don't just want to be on my phone all the time mm. and waste mm. that opportunity to connect. So I think one thing that I've learned after having kids while running a business is also to learn to be fully present wherever I am. Right. Mm. It's very interesting, guys. When she came here, she put her phone on another table. 
<laughs> she tried to hide it behind our TV because she didn't want to reply <laughs> messages. <laughs> 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 yes. No, but um, so like you mentioned, you did have a harder time conceiving than you thought, right? Mm. And I think it took more than a year mm. before you finally. You test- really did your homework, yeah. Thank it's you. It's not daily catch up. You think <laughs> what? <laughs> Can you share the moment that you found out you were pregnant with us? I think the moment I found out I was pregnant was almost trembling, you know, in disbelief. How did you like? Every month you were testing, is it or? Not really. I mean, only after my period, I, I had missed my period for an extended time. You're the time. rational kind. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, different, different, right? Fat test twice a week. <laughs> oh, but I can understand the excitement behind that, yeah, you know? Right. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it was only when I missed my period and secretly hoping that, yes, you know, right. mm-hmm. I was pregnant and that was how it was. Yeah. So Were you by yourself when you tested? Uh, I remember, I think it was like, past midnight and my husband sleeps very early because mm-hmm. uh, he wakes up very early as well so but yeah I remember it was past midnight I was alone I was trembling I took a photo I'm very close to my brother so I immediately sent them and then I ran out to wake Leo hmm. up so so actually yeah. your brother found out first whether he saw the message or not is another thing but yeah 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 I told them about the same time and yeah. then what was his reaction who Leo. my brother or Leo, <laughs> Leo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking um, yeah we were were like in disbelief because it's really something we've been trying for a while mm. and I think maybe for Leo he was almost mentally preparing himself that okay it might not happen you mm. know um, yeah so that was how it was yeah I was really excited how long after that did y'all decide to tr- start trying for a second kid maybe about mm. one and a half years later mm. 18 months or so you know I realized that okay I've Again, I've always known that I definitely don't want to stop at one. So if I want the second one, it also can't be too far away. Uh, wow. Yeah, Wait, you, so. you knew that before you had your first child? Uh? Yeah. So we but talked through with Leo that, okay, if you want to have a child, our preference is we don't only want a child. Yeah. Uh, only, don't only <laughs> want one uh, child, a yeah, single got it, child. Got it. <laughs> yeah. But after the first one, are you more inclined to have another one or less inclined? To have another one? <laughs> that's what, right? I would think the rational thing is always less. Eh? No, uh, that was like, there's so yeah. much trouble. Let's have two of you. What the f- so much, so economies of skill, right? But it doesn't <laughs> scale though, it's <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, for us, right? We have already known, so it was just like when, you know, when yeah, to right. try. That was it. And also then we thought that, okay, maybe it won't come as easy because the first experience, it also took a while. So we just decided to try right. about one and a half mm-hmm. years later. So with your most recent uh, baby, uh, you did mention also that you were a lot more paranoid when it came to this pregnancy, right? Mm. Are you comfortable sharing about mm. that? During the time where I was trying to conceive number two, uh, after Oliver, mm. uh, we had a, a miscarriage. And it, it was more like an etopic pregnancy. What happened was I was having like severe stomach cramps for days. Uh, I was bleeding a little bit. And it wasn't It wasn't until one day, I, one one night I couldn't get up at all. It was so, so, so painful that I decided to just ask my doctor friend, hey, do you think something is wrong? She said, okay, please check yourself in your a and immediately. So I just went to a and and, you know, in that span of a few minutes, they checked me and they told me that you were actually pregnant. Um, oh, you didn't even know you were pregnant. I didn't even know. Oh. And then they said, you're actually pregnant and you have an etopic pregnancy. We have to operate on you immediately. So etopic means the egg didn't latch on. Yeah, it, it, it is stuck on the fallopian tube. Ah. Mm. Mm. So it can be dangerous, right? Um, and also it's obviously not healthy for it to be there. So they needed to operate immediately. And so that was when also I was immediately, you know, had to change the gown, wheel into the operating theatre. And I, I, and so much of what was just going on in my yeah, head, yeah. right? Like, how severe is this, you know? And they were asking me so many different questions. When was the last time you eat? Because you're not supposed to eat technically, um, I think like 12 hours before surgery yeah. or six hours before surgery. Right. And obviously I just had dinner. So, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> the doctors and nurses were just reading to me the risk and things like that. And there was just so much going through my head um, from the realization that I was actually pregnant to the fact that, it, you know, I miscarried to the fact that I need to go into the operating theater now. So, and Leo was with you. La. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that was how, you know, um, I realized and, then went through the operation. I have a weird question. Yeah. Because I think, um, I mean, with, 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 with miscarriage, it's usually a very emotional event, right? Mm. And with someone as rational as you, mm. even though you are very empathetic as a person, mm. not knowing that mm. you were even pregnant, mm. was that still a very emotional period for you? 
Yes, because uh, I really wanted a second child. Right. Oh, y'all were trying. You just didn't yeah. know. I see. Yeah, and and I didn't know what it means. Like after this, is it gonna be even tougher? Because right. then I, I had to remove one whole fallopian tube, so <gasps> I was left with only one. So my chances of conceiving are halved. Because <gasps> usually, exactly. you know, one egg comes <laughs> yeah. from yeah. each month. So I was only fertile every other month instead Wait, of... Wait, oh, no, that's how it works. No way. What? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. didn't even know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then where does it go? Like if January, then now February, where? Then no, the tube is gone. There's nothing yeah. there. It just stays inside, the ovary. Oh. it stays inside the ovary. It stays inside the ovary. I actually yeah. don't know that. Oh, okay, in so okay, much okay. detail. The ovary is connected to the Philippine tube. Yo, if you knew which side it was, then like if you sleep on a certain side during that <sighs> month, maybe it helped. You know what I mean? Like mm. you don't know my something. Wow. Good suggestion. So much. Good yeah. suggestion. <laughs> don't <laughs> discount <laughs> mansplaining <laughs> pregnancy. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. Whoa. Do you know how like uh, Leo was affected by the miscarriage, like psychologically or emotionally? Mm. Mm. Good question. Because a lot of the times people just ask about the mom. But um, I'm here for the men. <laughs> Especially for Leo where he felt like I can't even really mourn about the loss because I have to take care of my wife and make mm-hmm. sure she's okay and mentally, you know, cheer her up and things like that. So I think he had to put that aside his own emotions aside for a bit uh, until he felt like yeah, I was better then he could properly talk through um, what he was feeling as well but definitely affected him also because we felt like we were in this together trying for a mm, while right. mm. when you did find out about your third pregnancy mm. then yes so back to your question yeah. yeah very much more paranoid I was very afraid of you know the risk of being miscarriage again because I didn't know what caused it, you know. Right. Oh. You did say that you went back to the doctor's office very often. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I showed up at my doctor's office instead of like maybe once in three to four weeks, I was there almost like every other week and sometimes the nurse will ask me, you're not even due for the checkup yet. Why are you here? Mm. And for me, I just told, I don't feel my baby moving. I just want to make sure that everything right. is okay. So right. it, it got that kind of paranoia, mm. you know. So now that you're a mother of two, actually very recent, the yeah. uh, baby girl. Three Congratulations. Plus, 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 plus. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. Now that you're a mother of two, do you think anything has changed? Um, I'm just slowly getting back to work again. Uh, so yeah, I think there's so much like it's, it's <laughs> just like, yeah, dealing with a newborn is really something else, yeah. right? Because yeah. every three hours, they need you to feed or mm. things like that. So You don't outsource, man? Uh, yes, for the Breastfeeding, how to outsource? Yeah. No, but also can pump. And, oh. and yeah, but also like, you know, I had confinement nanny mm, and yeah. help at home, which I'm so grateful for because I really believe it takes a village to build a strong team <laughs> yeah. and a strong home. Mm. So yeah, I think definitely they help. But still, there are some things that maybe as moms, you yourself also want to do. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so. I mean, now that we're in 2024, yeah. what are some things that you are looking forward to this year, both personally and business-wise. Having recently launched um, the I Am Well journal with Crystal Lim Langa uh, has been very exciting. So yeah, looking forward to see mm. what other magic we will create. You know her journal comes with a class. A what? There, oh. there was a day that Pat rushed me home from dinner or whatever the f***, right? <laughs> then they all go into a Zoom meeting that's 3,000 people, right? Oh, she was what? there! Yeah, of people that managed to cope the journal. So is like, it how to It's make- a f***ing journal with instructions on it. Why do you all need, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it was very. I, I was there. outside in the living room right. listening to you talking along with uh, another. Yes. Your partner. Crystal, yeah. yeah. Then yeah. Pat yeah. find her journal missing the next day. <laughs> <laughs> all, my shit, like, all my goals. <laughs> all your goals and your the tears. <laughs> <laughs> Business wise, I think for Love Bonito, it's our 14th year this wow. year, you know? And. They are twice the age of our company. Wow. Even though it's been such a journey, um, mm. so many lessons um, throughout. But I think we're really excited because 14 years, we are also excited to shake it up, you know, to see mm. what's next for us, you know, how can we continue to stay relevant, exciting for our customers. Yeah. So that's for you to stay tuned. We actually have a big um, unveiling this year. Ooh. So yeah, so that's... Where, where do we look? I love Bonito's Instagram for sure. Mm. Stay tuned, it's happening soon. Um, and then personally, yeah, just looking forward to also, I think as a founder, I've always known that my role evolves through the different seasons of mm. my business's life and to really mm. understand also and look deeper to ask myself, you know, what's next for me 
even within Love Bonito, mm. and if it's outside Love Bonito, so what it is, you know, to pers- continue to pursue passion projects like my podcast, mm. uh, and to continue to develop myself and grow personally. So yeah. So thank you very much for watching today's episode. We hope you've enjoyed yourself, and then we hope that Rachel has also <laughs> enjoyed herself. Thank you very much for joining us today. Follow Rachel on her socials and as well as Love Bonito. See you in the next episode. Bye bye. Like, share, subscribe. Do you even have the very first piece of, like the first article of clothing you ever made? No, we don't. But you know, I probably do. I, you know, cust- yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, you know, our customers do. Like you know, during our anniversary, they will send us screenshots or photos of like the first package that they received. They still Whoa. keep like the newsletter, the physical. Mm. Back then, it was still physical newsletter or things like like that. So yeah, it's very heartwarming. Fourteen years crazy, yeah. One of your office wall it should be the the history, mm. the timeline of the business. <laughs> timeline, yeah.